morning, everyone. We are very pleased uh, today uh, to have here with us Professor Anthony Mayanlati. He is a Finnish Canadian scholar, independent scholar, who has been living in Rome for 20 years. He dedicates uh, his uh, passion and his research to the history of Rome, to which uh, he dedicated his uh, PhD dissertation. Anthony Mayanlati has uh, author of uh, a uh, few very interesting books, uh, among which The Families Who Made Rome, A History and a Guide, that it will be the very topics of our interview. But before starting, I really wanted to say good morning, Professor Mayalati. Good morning, good morning, Dr. Uh, Lola Brigida. Yeah. I am sure that uh, I really pronounced your family name very badly. Please, uh, if you wanted to tell us uh, the <laughs> correct pronunciation of your, of your family name. My family name is Mayanlahti, which is Finnish, and uh, although people often look at it and think that it might be Indian, um, but uh, and then they're surprised when they see me. and. Uh, it has a meaning. Uh, it, it means the, the cottage, the, the lake of the cottage. So, uh, so I have a, a, a name that means something which, uh, which is uh, rare in Finnish. And what does it mean? Well, it means the, 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 the lake, Lahti means lake or bay, and Maya means cottage or, or small hut. And the N is possessive, so it's the lakes, it, the, 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 the cottage's lake or the cottage's bay. Well, you know that before I get to know you in person, I knew your book, I read your book, and the very first idea I had of you was that you were from India. So, and not from, <laughs> <laughs> from um, Finland or Canada. Uh, Professor Maialati, so your passion to the history of Rome, it is really uh, emotional for us because, you know, when a, a person coming from outside Italy and dedicates uh, uh, passion, research, uh, effort and energy to the history of Italy and the history of Rome, it is always uh, something very touching for all of us. How was your passion for Rome history born? Well, when I was a child, I was one of those children that uh, liked, to, liked to read in the library. I, I was once locked in the public library when it closed and had to leave through the fire door. Um, I, I wanted to be an Egyptologist when I was a child, and uh, then my interest moved to ancient Greece, then to ancient Rome, and then it gradually moved toward the present. And uh, my work, my, my university work, was all at, uh, about, about Rome during the early modern period, about Rome and the Renaissance. Uh, I'm very interested in, in the social history of art, particularly in, in the study of patronage, and I think there's something about Rome as a gigantic um, experiment in that extremely human endeavor which we call civilization, that is, the attempt of people to live together closely and to create methods of interaction uh, to resolve conflict and to create, which, which is unique. There's no other place in the world like Rome. Yeah, and your, um, your, the extract, I think, of your thesis of PhD dissertation, English Properties in Rome, 14, 15, 15, 17, it is uh, very uh, interesting, even because it covers a period of the history which is uh, very um, traveled in the history of Rome, you know, it really corresponds, for instance, uh, uh, with the taking over of the papacy of Pope Sistus IV, the mm -hmm. patron of the Sistine Chapel, and it really closes uh, right at the edge of the sack of Rome. So, which is the main uh, uh, reflection, or yes, upon, you know, that period of Rome, uh, looking at it with the lens of uh, Finnish Canadian historians and uh, through the English property in the city. Well, the English were just one of several different foreign communities in Rome that that probably began with pilgrims coming to Rome and then deciding to stay. And they established hospices for them for for the, for their communities and to support their hospices economically, they bought properties and they rented them out and they ran the hospice based on the rents that they got, which is exactly how churches in Rome often maintain themselves throughout Roman history. 
uh, throughout Roman Christian history. Um, so, what I noticed when I was when I was studying this was the incredible range of people, English people and Italian people, who were renting these English properties uh, from the the wealthiest uh, aristocratic uh, Romans to a merchant class. There's even someone who might have been one of the forebears of the Barberini who rents an English property in Rome. Um, down to English people who are renting English properties from the English hospice, there is one woman who is described as a Veronifex, that is, she makes uh, copies of the Veronica, which is a relic that's in St. Peter's, to sell to tourists, to sell to pilgrims. Uh, and in fact, the English had a, a corner on the market in terms of uh, relic selling that was their particular niche. The Germans were the innkeepers, and the English were the relic sellers, and so they would they would make uh, gold crowns, for example, for the Maronelle on the, on the street corners, and that's where we get the name for the Via dei Coronari, which is one of the streets that bounds uh, Palazzo Taverna. And uh, which was the uh, the main uh, or the principal neighborhood where the English community uh, used to live? Well, the nucleus of the community is in the area around, around let, let's say, around Piazza Farnese. Uh, a lot of properties in the English are in the area of Campo di Fiori and the area of um, Piazza Farnese. So next to St. Thomas of Canterbury Church? Yes, well, that's the English college, which was the old English hospice that was then converted in, into a Catholic seminary in the, in, in, by Gregory the Thirteenth, one companion in the 16th century. When there was a, a reformation in England, the English left the Catholic Church and the community began to die. And so this hospice building was then converted by the Pope into a college to train English to train Englishmen to become priests, to go back and reconvert the English and bring them back into the church. And in fact a lot of them uh, would train at the English college, go go back to go back to Britain, go back to England, get off the uh, get off the boat and eventually end up being killed by the English authorities for being Catholic. One of them, uh, particularly innocent, my favorite story is that one of them went off, got off the boat, the, the, man, the customs man at the, at the harbor said, you look like a priest. <laughs> and the priest said, I am. <laughs> and he was immediately taken and had his head cut off. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I call a word out of place, you know, you know making, giving the wrong answer. But, um, the English hospice is the oldest English property in Europe. It dates from 1360s, 1362 to 1363, and uh, it's been continuously English all through, from then until now. Okay, no, and no. so it's a fascinating case study in, in the way that Roman property changes, the use of property changes, and uh, the way that property passes from one person to another. Well, it is very interesting, uh, and I think that thanks to this uh, <coughs> to this research, uh, and uh, how long ago did you come to Rome the very first time? Well, the first time I came to Rome, I was an undergraduate, and it was in uh, the summer of 1989. And I remember I came off, I, I got out of Termini Station, and looked out across the noisy Piazza dei Cinquecento, and uh, across the filthy orange buses, and it was it was late afternoon. I could see the the, the shadows on the bricks of the of the of the, the baths of, of of Diocletian, behind, rising up behind the the umbrella pines. And I remember thinking, this is this is where I live. This is my this is this is where I this is where I, this is my home. Which was your very first impression when you started tra visiting? the city of Rome. I mean, what was your uh, emotion in front of the Colosseum or, you know, this very, uh, I think, kind of overwhelming uh, um, buildings and monuments for someone coming uh, from abroad? I, th I, I think that, you know, even for us, people from, from Rome, from Italy, uh, all the times we really are very close to, to, to those uh, uh, testimonies of the past times, uh, we we start wondering uh, 
about you know, the history, the sense of life, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really am I'm curious to know uh, what, I what was and what is uh, the feeling, the emotion uh, of uh, a foreign person in front of these uh, uh, monuments. It has no monumentum, something that has to be remembered. Mm. Well, I was already fascinated by Rome before I came. I had spent a lot of time studying it and and so finally seeing these things that I had studied from a distance was almost overwhelming. I remember uh, seeing, the, I remember the first time that I saw the Colosseum, I touched the, the, the wall of the Colosseum almost as if I was touching you know something that was electric that I had to be careful that would shock me um, because I was so overwhelmed by the by the the millennia of history um, now I've gotten used to it but I remember walking past the Pantheon and just stopping every single time just stopping and staring at it just being incredibly moved by it by this by its survival I remember going to the Galleria Borghese and seeing the, the Caravaggio's uh, da uh, David with the head of Goliath, which is one of his last paintings, and uh, I think a double self-portrait. And I remember begin I remember having tears in my eyes looking at it. And while well, you mentioned the Borghese Gallery, Galleria Borghese, <coughs> uh, which is one of the main uh, museums of Rome. Uh, and uh, and you're really just giving to me the uh, the protest to speak about your your book, the families who made Rome a history and a guide. When I saw it in one of the Roman uh, bookstores the very first time, I thought, what a fantastic idea! I just started to browse the book and to look at the the content. And they said, well, so it speaks about the Colonnas, the De La Rovere, you know, the Farnese, the Borghese, the Barberini, the Pamphili, and the Chigi. And I really thought that's a very, it's an, an idea, a book made just putting together some of the most important uh, parts of history, you know, the modern history of Rome. And uh, it uh, sees uh, at the history of Rome in a very different perspective, because even if the book uh, probably is adapted to other s scholars' research, the way you have been putting together the information, the methodology you are using is completely new, and uh, honestly. I would use it uh, as a handbook of history of Rome, because uh, even if it goes in, in depth, so in just giving a lot of details of information, this idea of uh, narrating the history of the city of Rome through the history of the families who made Rome puts Rome right at the same level of the national uh, important uh, uh, capital cities uh, of, uh, of the time, such as Paris, mm. London, or Madrid, or Naples, for instance. Mm. So I think that was uh, something uh, the literature of Rome was really lacking and waiting for. Uh, how did you get the idea of writing this book? Well, I think as, a, as an author yourself, you know that one thing that pushes a person to write a book is the desire to read a book that hasn't been written yet. I wanted to read this book, but it didn't exist, so I had to write it. Um, and I was constantly, um, I don't know quite how to say it, constantly um, provoked by the mentions in other guides, almost in passing, uh, about these uh, two references to these noble families that they wouldn't go into any detail. Like the, the blue guide to Rome, for example, will say about a church, you know, third chapel on the right, bracket, colonna, bracket. And then it will describe the, the paintings in it and so on. Okay, well, 
why did the colonists sponsor chapel in that church? Why did they choose those artists? Why did they choose that saint to, uh, uh, for, for the altarpiece? What's the story behind this particular piece of, uh, of work? And from there, I was curious to learn what was the story of these families? How did they, how did they develop in power? Where did they get their money from? How did they exercise their power? How did they want to represent themselves? And I discovered a whole world that I hadn't, I had dimly been aware of, but hadn't paid attention to. It was one of those things where it's on the edge of your attention, but you never notice it. And then you look at it suddenly and it, it takes form. So I was very interested to see how, for example, you can, you, you can, try, you can, you can really read Rome as if it were a, a kind of three-dimensional book, because Rome tries, because important buildings in Rome. I'm not talking about the smaller houses and things like that, ordinary people's houses, but the great, big Roman palaces and churches are all trying to say something, not just about, um, you know power in general or about uh, about faith in general but also about the people who had them built and this is this is demonstrable this isn't just an idea that i have it's a it, it happens because of a very simple fact uh, buildings cost money and to build something the patron wants to have his wants to have his say about how how this this building is going to look and that building has to reflect the patron's idea of, of who he is and who he wants the Roman people to think he is. So this is, this goes for chapels, this goes for palaces, villas, fountains, chapel, chap, everything. Um, we tend to talk about art history, and there is a strain in our art history that only talks about the development of the artist, as if the artist were the only figure that were important. But in fact, we know very well that that the artists didn't. Uh, work in a vacuum. They worked very closely and to the orders of the people who commissioned the work. That's that's important. And what you, you really said, you know, this is a 3D book. Yes. This is totally true. So while you were <coughs> talking, I was uh, really listening to you with curiosity because uh, I was trying uh, to remember what I felt a while reading your book. And so what you're saying is totally true. So the reader finds uh, the exact uh, uh, concept you are saying now. So it is a very important book uh, and uh, I'd like to highlight uh, um, the history of at least two families. Uh, uh, well, <coughs> um, the book starts from the history of the Colonna family uh, and uh, ends up at the Kiji. So let's say it covers a period from 1300 uh, until the seven late, uh, well, middle of 17, um, 1700. And, um, and it is uh, conceived uh, through itineraries. Mm. Uh, so because it is a handbook of history, a fantastic manual of history of Rome, but it is also a guidebook. So it really... Uh, uh, I tend to think of it as a, as, a so as a social history disguised as a guidebook. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It is really social. It's now what you really said at the beginning, you know, the social aspect of history in art history. That is very important because it helps people to better understand what history was in his and what art history has meant mm. for in the past times. Hmm? Uh, I would like to ask you, you know, that our, uh, our center here in Rome is uh, hosted in one of the most uh, ancient buildings in the city, even if it has been transformed through the times very uh, many times um, but um, it is Palazzo Taverna Orsini and uh, I would like to ask you something about the, the Orsini families uh, the beginning of their power and also the relation between the Orsini and their counterparts the Colonnas well the Orsini are uh, uh, an incredibly old and important medieval family, a baronial family. Uh, the Roman barons were the were, were the the class that dominated uh, Roman society in in the later Middle Ages. They were incredibly rich and owned tremendous amounts of property um, inside and outside the city. And in fact, they gained their wealth and their and their strength from their fiefdoms 
outside the city in the uh, Aga Romanos and the Agro Romano, the, the the land outside the city. There are many, many, many areas, many many towns outside of Rome that have castles that were once built by the Orsini and that are called Castle the Castello Orsini, and then their later owner because the Orsini's had a big economic crisis and had to sell off a lot of their property in the, in, in the 17th century. But um, in in the really beginning with the uh, with the uh, arrival on the papal throne of Nicholas III for a very short time from 1277 to 12, 1280 um, he so heavily uh, enriched his nephews that uh, that that in fact the word nepotism uh, which means favoring one's family um, in a in a corrupt way was possibly coined for him and Dante even even places him in in a circle of hell this pope for giving all of his money to uh, to the bear and the, all the little bears the bearlets because uh, because or orso means, means bear, bear and orsini <laughs> means the little bears and so uh, enriching the little bears was uh, was something that that happened to an intense degree in those three years of the pontificate and uh, three intense years of pontificate I'm sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you which uh, according to some scholars corresponded to a sort of proto-renaissance into the city of Rome just thinking of how, for example you know the Santa Santorum frescos uh, now mm -hmm. where Nicholas III he is giving uh, the legal model of the church to uh, to Christ uh, oh and, and it's not and, and that's one of the most important religious buildings in the city at the time because it's the, the private chapel of the Pope in his residence at the Lateran, and until we have to remember that in the Middle Ages the popes lived at the Lateran because the bishops of. The this is important. You do you, mm. you, you, you well to, under, to, to underline it to remember this fact. The, the bishops usually live next to their cathedral. The Cathedral of Rome is St. John Lateran, and the, and the Lateran Palace was the, bishops, was the bishop's palace, which was why for a thousand years uh, the Lateran Palace was this, the, the very pulsing heart of Roman power. And so when Nicholas III uh, built the Santa Sanctorum and decorated it uh, with, with, with frescoes and filled it with the most important relics, uh, it, was part of his, it was part of his suite of rooms in his chapel. Uh, and it was a powerful statement that said that, uh, that, said that the Orsini and the uh, and and the church were now closely intertwined, and in fact, subsequently, uh, the, in, in the factional warfare that followed for centuries, the Orsini generally tended to be pro-papal. They tended to be on the side of the pope against their enemies, the Colonnas, who were against the pope. They were on the side of whoever was opposing the pope, the king of Naples, the king of uh, or the uh, or the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, well, the Lateran, uh, you said really something very important uh, because one of the misconceptions uh, is that you know the popes had been living uh, in the in the Vatican forever, but actually we know very well that the Lateran was the basis of the political interest uh, from, let's say, Constantine times uh, up to the Renaissance. In the in your mission, you go to the Colonna because the Colonna had their patronal chapel in the Lateran. So in fact, it, 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 the Colonna family were closely attached to the Lateran for one, one very important reason, which is that after the papacy went off to Avignon in the, in the 1300s, uh, the Pope who brought the papacy back together after the schism when there were two and then three popes all competing uh, with each other, um, the pope that was elected to end the schism and bring the papacy back to Rome was Martin V Colonna, and and this pope it also ha it decided to be buried in, in in the Lateran, which was an important decision. Uh, that not every pope did. Most popes like to be buried in St. Peter's, close to their predecessor, uh, St. Peter, uh, as Bishop of Rome, but. Uh, Martin V chose to be buried in, in, Saint, in, in, in the Lateran, in St. John Lateran, because he wanted to remind the Romans and to reassure the Romans that the papacy would now stay forever in Rome. And so the, the great Colonna Chapel 
is also I in the in the in the latter, and it's called the Winter Choir, and you can never go and visit it, but <laughs> it's there, and. Uh, the the family's presence in the Lateran is, is is still very visible. You can see it in the pavement. You can see the family crest in the pavement. So it's it's an interesting point because it underlines the fact that the great the great power center of Rome. And they were the armed enemies of the Orsini. Oh yeah, constantly. <coughs> the, the 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 city was often divided into uh, neighborhoods that were almost like armed camps, and you could hardly cross between one neighborhood and another to the extent that sometimes papal processions would have to go around pr particular parts of town to avoid trouble. There's this one street, Via dei Soldati, um, next to Palazzo Altemps at the top of Piazza Navona, uh, the, the street of the soldiers, which demarcates the boundary line between Orsini-controlled territory and Colonna-controlled territory. <laughs> So this is this is another way in which the the conflict between Roman families makes itself present on the map of the city. Yeah, and you're mentioning uh, Martin V Colonna, who is uh, a strong uh, personality, uh, who, as you said, you know, brought back the papacy to Rome, and who uh, started that uh, visionary, but not really very visionary plan urban plan of Rome, the renovatio urbis Rome, the renovation mm. of the city of Rome, uh, which would have been uh, kept on through the centuries, from Martin V to... Well, I mean, uh, really, Rome begins to be reinvented when the papacy returns to Rome, but there's a serious problem with money. There's no money to restore, to renovate Rome, uh, and this development continues with uh, Nicholas V in the middle of the century, of the 15th century, and but real, real reconstruction of Rome, not theoretical reconstruction, but real reconstruction of Rome. And this is a real renaissance, this is, we're not talking about an intellectual renaissance like in Florence, but we're talking about a real rebirth of the city that had been, that was filled with two sets of ruins by the time Martin V came back. Ancient ruins and medieval ruins. The city was destroyed. It was. It was. There were wolves within the city walls, uh, and so the, the one of the peculiarities of the Roman Renaissance is that it's a real physical rebirth of the city. It's so one of the reasons why Leon Battista Berti was asked to come to Rome, you know, to, Oh yes. To 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 to, to bring uh, his uh, incredible theoretical energy, but also you know to try to give his vision on uh, how. To, to deal with the, the renovation. How yes, uh, and, and, and uh, really, uh, Alberti is one of the first great theorists of how to turn Rome into a more ideal city, how to make it more functional, how to restore the infrastructure, how to make it more monumental. And these are all ideas which, even if they're not followed in the Albertian pattern, these are ideas that are once placed in the minds of, of the Roman ruling class, the cardinals and the popes, begins to get developed and changed over the course of several centuries. So I would say that the idea of monumentalizing Rome and making it, you know, make Rome great again, You're <laughs> right. is something that happens over the course of many different centuries because it's continually being renewed, because the idea of Rome and what it's meant to represent changes over the course of the centuries. But I would really say, even in the 18th century, in the 1700s, Rome is still reinventing itself in a new monumental way. So there's a, a tremendous amount of power in this idea of returning Rome to its ancient greatness. And, you know, <coughs> and just a little going back just a, a few minutes uh, on the Renaissance times now, mm -hmm. because you're mentioning uh, uh, Florence and Rome and these mm -hmm. two different uh, uh, vision of what Renaissance meant. But at a certain point, right in the second half of the 1400, the 15th century, these two cities in a way met each other. And I'm referring uh, to the marriage of wh when Clarice Orsini mm -hmm. uh, married Lawrence the Magnificent, because for instance, this is a kind of uh, dark side of the history and a little known side of the history. You know, these mm. two these uh, two cities, uh, which really gave to the history to giants, to important protagonists. 
Lawrence the Magnificent from Florence mm -hmm. in Clarice, Orsini from Rome, from this palace action. Yes, well, uh, Clarice is one of the one of the key figures in, in absolutely in, in Florentine history, which is curious for a Roman woman. Uh, but she went to Florence, and during the periods when her husband was, for one reason or another, out of out of town, she took control uh, of the Medici bank and of the of the fortunes of the family. Um, and so she was, and she was also because she was half Roman. She was a kind of direction pointer for where the Medici wanted to move to next. And in fact, uh, her her son Giovanni uh, is made a cardinal at a very young age, and this half Orsini Medici, this half Roman Florentine. We can't forget that he was half Roman. He could almost describe himself as Roman uh, because he spent so much of his life in Rome. Uh, becomes cardinal and then is elected pope as Leo X in the in the in the, the second decade of the of the of the fifteen hundreds. So, what we have is in fact a really important mixture of the. Florentine intellectual humanist Renaissance tradition that, um, that actually Clarice Orsini was very hostile to. <laughs> she she thought that they were all just a bunch of pagan idolaters and wanted her children to have nothing to do with them. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent raised his children in this intellectual atmosphere, and she and and Leo X when he became pope strengthened his family's connection with the Orsini by um, making sure that another Medici married Alfonsina Orsini and uh, a, a palace that now belongs to the Aldo Brandini, much like this palace, um, uh, Palazzo uh, Medici Lante della Rovere, is, was built as a Medici palace for this couple, another Medici uh, Orsini alliance. Mm. So there's this very strong underlying uh, a, a connection between the Medici's and the we were the ruling family of Florence and the Orsini who could take on a new importance uh, in this period. Thanks to the marriage to, to the liaison mm. uh, with the with the Medici family. Yes, absolutely. Well, these matrimonial alliances uh, were very important. Well, in Europe, in modern times, all over Europe in modern times, but particularly in Rome because. Uh, well, the presence of the popes some, somehow overwhelmed, uh, well, no, the, and even obscured a little bit, no, the the other um, mm. the other baronial families who probably had to find a way to no through marriages to uh, take over and strengthen their power. Is correct? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, 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 the nature of the Roman aristocracy can't be separated from the strange nature of a Ro the Roman Roman monarchy because the Pope was a monarch, but he was elect an elected monarch. It wasn't a hereditary monarchy. And so every time a new Pope was elected, a new family became the new royal family. And this is an idea that becomes developed really more intensely in the second half of the 16th and then into the 17th century, but really um, these families are raised up but they're raised up often from nowhere. They're raised up from the you know the, the head of the Franciscan order, and then in term, for example, with Sixtus the Fourth, um, or various other different play people from f other places, other cities. And so, one of the things that that new families, papal families, are very keen to do is to tie themselves into Roman history by marriage, by making a al marriage alliance with an old Roman family, and these is almost exclusively the Orsini or the Colonna, the two most important old Roman families. There was even another one uh, we, who well, actually has always played the sort of, uh, how can I say, uh, kind of weird the role you know, in the uh, political geography of Rome, the Massimos. You, you, you are not covering, for instance, or just you are 
touching aside, no, in your book. Well, Why? Then, well, the Massimos are a, a, a fascinating family as well, um, because they are. First of all, they claim to be the oldest of the Roman noble families. That's why I'm so. Which is which is which is not true in, in the sense that um, they 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 claim descent from Fabius Maximus, who was the the great enemy of Hannibal, the great Roman general who who fought against Hannibal. There's no <coughs> demonstrable connection between the two, and in fact, the Massimos begin to appear really in in the 14th century as spicers, as spice merchants, uh, but they become. They, they rise up into the nobility and uh, then they make a, and this is typical of Roman noble families, they create an ancient, an, an ancient ancestor, and which, which is all for the same reason, which is to say, we are rich and powerful now because we've always been rich and powerful, we've always been important to Roman history. See, this is our great ancestor. But what's interesting about the Massimos is that in all of their history, they only had two cardinals. They weren't a papal aristocratic family. They were an urban aristocratic family. They were connected to the city of Rome. And so if you go to the Capitoline Museums and you look at the fasti consulares of the modern period, that is the, the not the ancient ones, but the, 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 the list of civic officials, on every single plaque there are two, one or two massimo, because they have a civic, uh, a, a civic uh, vocation. And why do they have this? Because they claim descent from this great Roman general, Fabius Maximus, who then put down his weapons and resigned all of his, 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 his honors and went back to ordinary life. Uh, and in this case, the, the Massimo family would grow up in their palace, surrounded by frescoes painted by Daniele da Volterra, showing scenes of the life of Fabius Maximus and giving them an example of how they should live their lives, giving their lives for the city. And so they dedicate themselves to the city, not to the papacy. Yeah, and what is really, you know, uh, strange that it is a, a older Roman aristocratic families were in a way not actually those who made Rome. So the, the, the family who made, the families who made Rome in the modern times, in 1500 and 1600, were the Borghese, the Barberini, or the mm. Chigi, they were not they're not Roman. They were not Roman. They're not Roman. I mean, uh, um, you'll notice on the facade of St. Peter's that, uh, that Paul V describes himself as Paulus Quintus Borgesius Romanus. He's proud to say that he's Roman because he was born in Rome, uh, but he's actually from, he's from a Sienese uh, noble family uh, of, of the of minor aristocracy, the, 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 the urban administration of the, of the city of Siena gain the kind of aristocratic status, what the French used to call the, the noblesse de cloche, the, the, the clock nobility, because you can... Uh, it's the nobiltà di, di, di spada and nobiltà di toga in Italian. You yes, know, so. yes, so this is very much the nobiltà di, ta, di toga. Mm -hmm. This is the, 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 the bureaucratic nobility. But they came to Rome and um, very often, because Rome is such a curious type of, of monarchy, such an... Again, Rome is always exceptional. It's never, it's never normal. It's not a normal city today, and it never was, because it always had an unusual government. It always had a strange system of it. And it was always, this is the strange thing, Rome is always a place where social mobility is much more possible than it is anywhere else. You can go from nothing to being pope in the blink of an eye, uh, because you can, you can rise up through your religious order, and then be elected cardinal, and then be elected pope, and suddenly, your 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 family of of, of uh, fishermen <laughs> is going. To, and this is this is an ex I mean, maybe a bit exaggerated, but you can go from being nobody to someone really important in Rome, something which is not possible anywhere else. Well, you know, the conversation with with you is really very interesting. Uh, I would be. Uh, forever, you know, talking with you about this fantastic history, but uh, we uh, we have to go for uh, the the conclusion. But before before that, I would really add uh, a few more things. One about other, you know, I'm, I, I studied uh, women, the history of women, so I'm pretty much curious about. Uh, that part of the history, and w what about uh, another uh, interesting, curious uh, uh, figure or protagonist uh, 
woman protagonists in the history among these families you cover in your book? Well, I, the fact is that, that from the Renaissance onward, about half of Rome's most important buildings, churches and palaces, were built and ordered by women. Women are 50% of, uh, of, of, of the most important um, patrons and sponsors of art and architecture in Rome. But Rome seems like such a masculine city. It seems like the, a city of priests and a city of, of, of cardinals. nobles, uh, cardinals and, and uh, that whole male ruling class. This is because women don't put themselves forward on the facades of churches. They don't put their names on things. You have to look more carefully to find the presence of women. And may, you do, may, may, may you do uh, any examples, or uh, famous examples, so a, a building uh, which really strikes the attention of tourists uh, and, oh, good, that was done by, or, well, ordered by a woman. Well, you can find, for example, the spectacular chapel of uh, Lucrezia Gara della Rovere in, uh, in, uh, San, in the, the Trinità dei Monti, all frescoed by Daniele da, da Volterra, uh, where uh, Volterra uh, pushes the technique of fresco to its absolute limit so that, so that you can see that the cloth that uh, uh, the figures are wearing shimmers and coruscates like, uh, like silk, which is very difficult to do with, 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 fresco. with fresco, which is usually rather dull. Um, and uh, only if you look carefully can you find signs that this is done by a woman. Usually what you find are, are crests that have a division in two, one side is, is, is the woman's father's crest and the other side is the woman's husband's crest. That's what a female crest looks like. And so where you find this crest, you know that a woman has sponsored it. Uh, another building that's really important is, uh, that, was, that was founded by a woman was uh, the Sant'Andrea della Valle, uh, which was uh, made possible by the do donation by Costanza Piccolomini of, of her palace to the, the Theatine Order so they could demolish their church, their little church that they had, and build a gigantic church in the side of her palace. And uh, she gave them money as well. She was a descendant of uh, the family of two popes, also from Siena the Piccolomini. Um, and she was a Duchess of Amalfi. So this is an, a really important uh, female um, sponsorship of art and architecture, which just disappears. It just vanishes from the map. Well, I think that this might be really a topic for another book uh, because, you know, just uh, to extract the history of, of these women and to put them together in, again, you know, in mm. illustrating the history of Rome through another perspective. Well, I'm really delighted uh, uh, hearing your, your history, the, your how the, the way you narrate the history. It's really fascinating and I'm sure that. Uh, uh, our audience uh, will be delighted too. Uh, well, uh, again, we have to go forward to the conclusion, but be before really ending up our splendid uh, conversation, uh, your next uh, work, what are you doing now? What are you right studying? Now, right now, I am writing a, uh, a large book, a project that I would never have taken on by myself. It was, I was commissioned, this is the first book that I've done that I was commissioned to write, and I was commissioned to write it by the Oxford University Press. Congratulations. Which is a colossal honor for me. And uh, it is a single volume history of the city of Rome from its foundation until today. And it looks at Rome as a living organism, how it grows and shrinks, how it changes over time, how it, how it uses its own idea, the idea of itself, to reinvent itself continually. And it's a, a mammoth task. I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but there are you know, bells ringing now. I think that is a kind of how uh, it gives, puts us inside the right atmosphere of Rome. No? So the past times, uh, which is still present in well, whenever I hear the bells ring in Rome, I always feel that sense of connection with the past, which is, I think, the thing that someone that comes from, from North America feels most strongly when they come to Rome, is that suddenly you are, you are, you are, you are a part of this, this great city, this history, the, the sound of the bells that, has been, that have been ringing for centuries and centuries are now ringing in our ears. 
and that now we too are part of this history. That's the sense of the Turner Road, no? Yes. Of, of, your, of your book. Uh, very last question, Anthony. Uh, what would you uh, say to a student from North America? Uh, the reason to come to Rome. Why is it important to come to Rome? What is the sense of the history? Because, you know, uh, many times our students are a little bit skeptical about the history. I personally teach history and art history, and so to me sometimes it's difficult to, to make them understand the importance of history as a master, you know, as a, an example even for modern times. You come from the North America. So yeah. what, what would you suggest to a student to, to, to tell him, her, the importance of the history and the history of Rome? Well, I think that coming to Rome and learning the history of Rome is incredibly important because the history of Rome is unique. Rome has always been an important city. It is, throughout the course of its history, it's never been of second, second level importance. It's always been the place, the, the great stage for uh, what, what, what a Spanish playwright called the great theater of the world. This is where uh, events happened that could only have happened here. This is where the most improbable people meet, uh, John Keats meeting Napoleon's mother, for example, or um, any number of other, uh, other figures who find Rome a great source of inspiration and a place that 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 continually teaches us how we got along in the past and how we are meant to get along and how can we get along in the future it's not just something to do with the past because our history doesn't end with us it moves forward into the future and so when we come and study Rome and look at it and under try and understand it we're understanding ourselves as well and, and, and the way that Roman history develops gives us a sense of where things might go in the future for us. So it's very immediate, it's very, it's very practical, it's very specific. It's, this history is also our history. You know, oh, I, I always, <clears throat> since a couple of years, well, before the pandemic, of course, uh, I always started my course uh, reading the Declaration of Roosevelt, to President Roosevelt, so when he decided to uh, to come to Rome to defend Rome because the meaning of Rome is, you know, is a uh, is sort of have a capital mm, point mm. for the defense of our civilization. What do you think about it? I think that that's absolutely important. I think that it's central. I think that a lot of what creates us as modern people comes from ideas that begin in Rome. And I would like to finish by expressing one idea that, that a, a 19th century author wrote about Rome, which is, he says, we all have two fatherlands, the one that we were born in, and Rome. Thank you, Anthony. This uh, really could not be a better way to finish our splendid conversation. I thank you very much. I thank you for myself, but also on behalf uh, of the whole faculty and staff of the University of Arkansas um, Center for your presence here together, which really enlightens uh, our, our program. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.